2 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. It says, therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Open your hearts to us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have cheated no one. He says, and I do not say this to condemn, for I have said, theref- I have said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. He says, I am filled with comfort and exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation. Notice in verse 5, he says, For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts, inside were fears. Nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was comforted in you. When he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you, Lord, for our time this morning in your word. Lord Jesus, we pray, God, that you would speak directly to each heart that is here. God, for each person that has a difficulty or a problem, a tribulation in their life, God, we pray, Lord, that your spirit would speak to each need, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would, you would do your work, Lord, within our hearts this morning with your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Last week I had mentioned that the letter of, when the letter of 2 Corinthians was written, there was no chapter breaks. You remember that it was a continuous letter that was, being, that was written by the Apostle Paul. And in fact, chapter divisions that are commonly used today were developed in 1227 AD by Stephen Langston, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Later on in the 1500s, a man by the name of Stephanus was the first to divide the New Testament into standard numbers and verses in the year 1555. And I say that because although they did a wonderful job, a great job of doing that and dividing the Bible into chapters and verses in order for us to find it better, it would be extremely time consuming if I said, get out your New Testament scroll and find what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, like it would just be, we'd have to skip the greeting and the coffee, and nobody wants that. So it's a benefit to us. But while they did that, occasionally there is a verse that possibly should have been in context with a previous chapter. One before us this morning. You notice in second the second half of Second Corinthians 6 was dedicated to the exhortation for believers to come out of the joint participation in sin with unbelievers and to repent and to return to the Lord. And with that in mind, we notice verse 1 probably should have been included in chapter 6, but nevertheless, it's here before us and we're not going to skip it. Notice it says in verse 1, Therefore, having these promises... Now, what is Paul speaking of when he speaks of the promises? If you were with us last week, you remember the promises of God that Paul reminded us of if the Corinthians were to come out of their sin and come out of the joint participation of evil with the world. He says, come and be separate, says the Lord. And he says, the promises that I will receive you, I will be a father unto you. And he says, you will be my sons and my daughters. And thus, therefore, having these promises, verse 1, beloved, that speaks of you and I, he says, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit, perfecting, that word literally is completing holiness in the fear of God. Because the Corinthians lived in one of the headquarters of immorality, 
in the ancient world, it also allowed, and they also allowed themselves to be yoked together or kind of joint together with the filthiness of the culture. Paul exhorts them to be cleansed from the filth of the world. And one of the things I think is interesting when we look at this verse, Paul makes a differentiation between the cleansing from the flesh and the cleansing from the spirit. See, we oftentimes think of purity before the Lord in the terms of cleansing from all the filthiness of the flesh, but there's also the filthiness within the spirit that we need to cleanse ourselves from at the foot of the cross. For example, Sometimes it's oftentimes, it's just easier to deal with the filthiness of the flesh because oftentimes it's more oftentimes than people see that. But the things in the spirit are oftentimes hidden. You remember during Jesus's earthly ministry, you find that there were multiple people coming to Jesus and they're just, they had all sorts of just issues of the flesh, sin issues in the flesh. Think of there were harlots that came to Jesus. There were people that were caught in adultery. There were people that did this and there were people that did that. And there were tax collectors that were stealing from people. And they came to Jesus and you, it was just, it was a no-brainer. It was like, absolutely. But do you remember when the Pharisees came to Jesus? And they had those issues in the spirit, those sin issues in the spirit where there was, where there was pride, where there was uh, envy, there was all these different things that, listen, we are oftentimes very good at covering those things up. And those are things that still need to be dealt with by the cross of Jesus Christ. And we th oftentimes assume, uh, you know, we got to deal with, you know, issues of things that are on the outside of lust and pornography. And we do, no doubt. But let's not forget about the things that are in the spirit, things that are hidden. It's imperative that we go to the Lord and we say, Lord, try me. Know if there's any wicked way in me. Show me and lead me in the way of everlasting. If there's anything hidden within me that I'm hiding that I don't even know about that I'm hiding, Lord, show me. You know, it's oftentimes, it's, you know, it's interesting, you know, when we were moving a couple of months ago, um, and there's just things that, uh, that just get hidden uh, in my corner of the room. You know, my wife will say, hey, can you take care of this? And I was like, oh, yeah, I'll put it away. <laughs> any, any other guys? Okay, just me. Never mind. And, and you just, and, you, and you're like, oh, wow, I didn't. You know, we're moving. It was like, oh, that's where the pair of socks went. I was looking for those, you know. Should have just put them away and dealt with them. And oftentimes, that's what we do. And we forget about some of the things that we have hidden away. See, we can hide pride. We can hide these things away, but listen, we got to come before the Lord in honesty and say, Lord, cleanse me from these things by the power of the cross. James tells us that we are to lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness by receiving the implanted word of God. And we know that Hebrews tells us that the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword and it pierces to the division of spirit. And thus, we need to come before the Word of God and say, Lord, show me if there's anything that needs to go in my life and bring me to the cross and cleanse me. Amen? As we continue on, as we allow the Lord to correct us, Paul goes on to explain some of the difficult things as a pastor that he had to do. Notice in verse 3, he says, I do not say this to condemn, for I have said before that you are in our hearts. He says, to die together and to live together. Because the Corinthians needed to be corrected in many areas that Paul was quite upfront about in the church, and he just can, would confront the issues of sin, even the Apostle Paul, and having to confront the church, and when he did that in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, he tells us, he says, listen, I don't do these things to shame you. In other words, I'm not putting it out there on social media. Can you believe what the Corinthians are doing? He's not doing it to shame them, but he says, I'm doing it in a way that I don't want you to be condemned as the flock of God. See, there are oftentimes there are churches that will use the word of God as a whip oftentimes to condemn the flock. And oftentimes what they do is they end up beating the sheep. They just will constantly... You know, this is what God says. 
boom, you know, and just start cracking the whip. And look, there are issues that need to be dealt with in our lives, and it is important that we, all, we always bring it back to grace because the grace of God is sufficient. See, whenever there's a heavy subject that oftentimes Paul would address in the Corinthian church, he'd always bring it back to grace. He says, listen, this is what is going on in the church. And he says, I'm not saying this to condemn you. I'm saying this in a way that is going to bring you back to the, into the grace and bring you back into the fold. I don't want you wandering out there, is what Paul's saying. And even though Paul had to do this, something that is very difficult in confronting many of the issues of the church, he did it in a way where he was very gracious. See, sometimes in our lives, we have to confront other people. I don't need a show of hands, but I'm sure many of us have had to confront people on different occasions. And one of the things that is very easy when you go into confrontation and say, hey, listen, which by the way is a biblical thing. Jesus instructs us of that in the Gospel of Matthew. If someone sins against you or they, they offend you, go to your brother, tell them their issue. Don't, you know, don't, uh, don't come in with condemnation in your confrontation. Come in with grace. See, what can happen is if you come in with condemnation and you say, hey, listen, this is what you did. Uh, I didn't appreciate that. And you come in, and oftentimes what happens is the other person will say, oh yeah, well you remember this, and you remember that. And it's just like, it's just, it turns into an all-out war, and then both sides are taking shots at one another. Have you ever been there? Or just, you're laughing because you have, hey. <laughs> it's just, you know, it's just like, you did this. And then and it's like, we're arguing like children here. Like, what happened? The Apostle Peter gives us great instruction that I believe can be applied to confrontation. He says in 1 Peter chapter 3, he says, be of one mind. And he says, having compassion for one another. He says, love his brothers. And he, sees, he says, be tenderhearted and courteous. And he goes on to say, not exchanging evil for evil or revile for revile. He says, but on the contrary, he says, extend a blessing. And he says, this is what you were called to. In other words, we're not called to take shots at other people in confrontation and use confrontation as an umbrella to, you know, just tear someone down. The Bible says that we are to edify or build up. And the way we are to do that is not exchanging revile for revile, but on the, on the contrary, Peter says a blessing. And he says, have compassion in those moments. He says, be tenderhearted and courteous. Now, as we continue on in verse 4, he says, great is my boldness of speech toward you. He says, great is my boasting on your behalf. He says, I am filled with comfort and I am exceedingly joyful in our tribulation. You know, when my family and I will oftentimes, uh, every two or three weeks, we'll go to Costco um, and eat the samples. And, um, <laughs> and we'll, yeah, we do shop there. Um, but we, and we go there and, you know, we'll do our thing and we'll make that lap and um, try to hit as many samples as we can. And in doing so, you know, you get to the end and they, you know, you get in that checkout line that's um, two kilometers long. And, you know, uh, if you go to 91st, at least it is, um, <laughs> there's a lot of head nods in here for that. And, you know, you get there and they, you know, they ring you up and then you go to that another line that seems to be about a kilometer long. And, you know, they mark off your receipt. Uh, and I could not believe there was one occasion, because oftentimes, you know, they're just, you know, it's like they're looking the other way. And you're just like, yeah, you're good. You know, I'm like, I could have stole like a playground, you know. Um, but there was one occasion where they looked at our receipt and they said, they rang you up for something incorrectly. And so we had to go back, to, you know, in line. And then we went back in the line. And they said, we can't do anything for you. Uh, you know, and I'm getting more frustrated. And then you go back to the manager's line and they say, okay, let me have to, you know, fix this. And I said, so did I save any money? And they said, no, they just, there was something that was mislabeled. And I was thinking like, we went through all that just to have a mislabeling. You know, oftentimes when something is mislabeled, it can be quite frustrating. One of the things that I see being mislabeled in our culture 
against Christians is this idea, if you are enthusiastic about Jesus or you are bold with the gospel of Jesus Christ, all of a sudden you have this mislabel that you are an extremist. Oh, you're an extremist. I can't believe you get, you know, hey, it's cool if you believe in God, but once you start talking about Jesus, just tone it down a little bit. Listen, now when has that ever been something that has been beneficial? We should stand for our convictions. Listen, we should have a conviction that Jesus Christ died and he rose again, and we will be with him forevermore in eternity. Listen, we need to have a conviction. We need to have a boldness. Listen, the, the world is constantly going to mislabel us with, with extremists, this, or whatever the case may be. But listen, we're called to be bold with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus told the, told the church of Laodicea, he says, I wish you were hot or I wish you were cold. He says, because you're not, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Listen, church, we've been, we are called to be bold with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. When you look around the Bible, at many of the great people of the Bible, one of the attributes you find of God's people that were greatly used was they had boldness of speech. You think about Noah. Noah just wasn't building a boat. A boat. The Bible says that he was a preacher of righteousness. He was preaching the gospel message. Jeremiah didn't preach feel-good sermons. David stood before a giant and said, you come with me with a sword and a spear and a javelin. He says, but I come with you with the name of the Lord of hosts. This, these men were bold with the, with the message of, of God. And by the way, you know something that is extremely difficult to do? Paul says here that I was in tribulation. It is really difficult to be in tribulation and to be bold with the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But one of the things the world needs to see from our lives, not just when things are good, not when things, everything is going according to plan in our lives, but in tribulation, we need to have boldness that Jesus Christ is still the king of our lives. Amen? Now, as we continue on in verse 5, it says, For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, Paul said, Our bodies had no rest. He says, We were troubled on every side. He says, outside were conflicts, inside were fears. Allow me to give you a little context of what is taking place here. While Paul was away from Corinth on a long missionary journey, he received reports about the church that had deeply concerned him. In fact, he became so troubled that he could not even complete the ministry that was taking place in Troas. But what could he do about the situation in Corinth? Well, evidently, he decided to send his friend and his colleague, someone who studied under him, and Titus. And Titus would go as an emissary to Corinth to try to resolve the situation in Corinth and bring back that report. And Titus did do that. Titus would go to Corinth, and he would go before them. Many people believe that is when Titus delivered what is called a severe letter, that Paul had to write a severe letter to the church telling them they needed to repent. And in doing that, when Paul was waiting for Titus to return in Macedonia, evidently Titus did not come according to plan. And keep in mind, there's no social media, there's no texting, there's, no, there's nothing of that nature for Paul to be like, you know, to get updates and, you know, see his Instagram story and see that, oh, Titus is on his way back, great, you know, we're going, you know, he can't text him, he has no clue. And all Paul could do was simply wait for Titus to return after Paul delivered a message that was quite severe to the Corinthian church. And he describes his feelings while he was waiting after he had sent the message. He says, our bodies had no rest. He says that we were troubled on every side. And he says that we're outside, there was conflicts. That word conflict literally describes a clash or a conflict that can either be physical or non-physical, and it speaks of personal relationships. And then Paul says that there were fears. That word fear is the word phobos, where we get our word phobia. And Paul essentially is saying, I, outside there was, there was fightings everywhere. There was conflicts everywhere I turned. Inside, he says, I was afraid. Have you ever felt that way? 
You just feel like there's just times where you're just like, everywhere I go, whether it's my family or, you know, my, uh, my workplace, there's just conflict wherever I go. And he says, and he says inside, I was afraid. This is, this is the apostle Paul. And he says, I was just, my body was exhausted. He says, I was gripped with anxiety. I was struggling inside and out. But look where Paul turned to in verse 6. He says, nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast. How many times for you and I have we been at that point? And we think, Lord, I, this, there's, just, there's an argument every which direction. There's just, there is a conflict. Everybody seems to want to fight me on this issue or whatever it may be. And, you know, Lord, I'm just, I'm afraid inside and it's producing an anxiety that's wearing on my physical body and I'm just, I'm becoming exhausted. But nevertheless, God stepped in and he came and he comforts the downcast. I think one of the major misconceptions that oftentimes we think is that people who are more spiritually mature than us never need the comfort of God. But the Apostle Paul certainly needed the comfort of God. Perhaps you remember Elijah. Elijah was another man who needed comfort. Do you remember in 1 Kings chapter 18? In 1 Kings chapter 18, it says that he called down fire from heaven, physical fire. It says that he challenged the prophets of Baal, that they were dancing, they were cutting themselves, trying to call fire from heaven. And Elijah, it says that he wet his sacrifice, he put water on his sacrifice, made it so that it would be impossible for it to catch fire. And it says that he prayed and fire fell from heaven. Could you imagine that? If we just had a bonfire and you say, hey, anybody bring magic? No, no, worry about it. We'll just pray. How's that sound? That sounds good to me. I just, that would be crazy. But, and you remember in the very next chapter, in 1 Kings chapter 19, it says that the queen, Jezebel, made a remark about Elijah and it sent Elijah into hiding. And he goes and Elijah runs to the Lord in hiding and he says, Lord, I just want to die. That's what he says. He, this is a man that just called fire from heaven. The Bible says in James chapter 5, it was a man of nature like ours. He was just like us. He's just, he's the same kind. Of, he's, he's made of flesh. He's just, just like us. He's calling down fire one minute in one chapter of his life. And in the next chapter, a woman says something and he just runs. He just, he just I, Lord, I just want to die. Let's just, just end it, Lord. And then it says that the Lord met him in that place and ministered to him, comforted him, fed him, all those things. The Lord comes and does that. Isn't it interesting? The world in which we live in, they turn to so many different things for comfort. We have everything. We have comfort food. And I'm not opposed to that, by the way. I love comfort food. I eat it every day. <laughs> um, we have comfort food. We have comfort clothing. I, I heard, I read an article the other day that there was somebody that had an emotional support alligator that tried to get into a Philadelphia Phillies game in Clearwater, Florida. I'm, I'm not kidding. I, I lived in Florida for 12 years and it does not surprise me. Just, there are people that will turn from anything to food to alligators for support. Listen, the Bible says that we serve the God of all comfort. Listen, where are you turning to in these moments when fear is gripping inside, when there's anxiety? Where do you turn to? Listen, the Bible says that we serve the God of all comfort. You turn to Jesus. Jesus is far greater than anything this world can offer. Turn to the Lord. Jesus tells us, and Matthew records for us in Matthew chapter 12, that he says, a bruised reed he will not break. In a smoking flax, he will not quench until he sends forth justice to victory. And Matthew records the prophecy from Isaiah chapter 42 confirming Jesus' messianic ministry. And he tells us that a bruised reed, he will not break. And a smoldering wick, he will not quench. And a bro broken reed is not beyond repair. And a smoking flax can be reignited. Perhaps this morning, you feel broken. 
or you feel like the fire has gone out in serving the Lord or in some manner, friend, turn to Jesus. If you turn to Jesus, it says that he will not break you any farther. He will reignite the flame that was there. Turn to the Lord, the God of all comfort. You notice as we continue on, we find that the way the Lord used Paul or used comfort in Paul's life, it says in verse 6, it says that he comforts us by the coming of Titus. And he goes on and he says, and not only by his coming, but by the consolation in which he was comforted in you. And that he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning and your zeal for Paul, and so that I rejoiced even more. When Titus did finally return, God used Titus to deliver a message that comforted Paul greatly. And I think oftentimes God uses people to comfort his people. Perhaps the Lord wants to use you in your life to bring a message of comfort to another believer. The Bible tells us in actually the beginning of 2 Corinthians, Paul opens in chapter 1 and verse 3 in saying that we serve the God of all comfort, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies. And he says that we are able to comfort others who are in trouble. I think it's interesting, 29 times in the book of 2 Corinthians, the word comfort is used. And by the way, when someone oftentimes comforts another person, they use the gift of exhortation. And perhaps you want to be someone that goes and they and brings comfort into someone else's life. You know, there have been times when early on in ministry where someone would come to me and there was just something heavy that, and I was just like, oh man, I don't know what to say about this one, you know? And I just think, and I remember someone came to me and said, listen, you need to pray for the gift of exhortation. And it, someone who exhorts, also encourages and comforts. And one of the ways they do that is by the reading and the memorization of Scripture. And one of the things, if you want to be someone who comforts other people, know the Word of God and ask the Lord to give you the gift of exhortation. The, the book of Proverbs says in Proverbs 27, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Now, as we continue on in, in chapter 7, we come pick up in verse 8. It says, For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it. Watch this. Though I did regret it. You ever had those moments where you're like, I didn't regret it. Actually, maybe I regretted it a little bit. It's encouraging to me that the Apostle Paul has the same thoughts I do. Anyways, for I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Now I rejoice, not only that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but sorrow of the world produces death. Verse 11 says, for observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you. What clearing of yourselves. What indignation. What fear. What vehement desire. What zeal. What vindication. In all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this manner. Therefore, although I wrote to you, I did not do it for the sake of him who had done the wrong, nor for the sake of him who suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God may appear to you. Therefore, we have been comforted in this manner, and we rejoice exceedingly more for the joy of Titus because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. For if, any, for if in anything I have boasted to him about you, he says, I am not ashamed, but as we spoke all things to you, in truth, even so our boasting to Titus was found true, and his affections are greater for you as he remembers the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling you received him. Therefore, I rejoice that I have this confidence in you in everything. 
as we had mentioned, the Apostle Paul had written that severe letter. And we see really how difficult it was for him because he says, I didn't regret sending the letter and then I did regret it. You ever have emails where you're like that, where you're just, you're like, I'm, I'm going to hit send, send. Oh, I shouldn't have did that. Now you can actually unsend it. I can't believe that. But it's wild. Um, Paul says, I regretted it. Then I didn't regret it. But one of the reasons that Paul had such a hard time sending the letter to rebuke their sin was because he knew it would do a couple of things. Notice in verse 10, he knew it was going to make them sorry. It says in verse 10, for godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Now, there is a big difference between regret and repentance. I guarantee you, if you went to uh, the prison just outside of Edmonton and you went and you went to interview several of the inmates. Let's say you interviewed 50 of the inmates and you said, hey, I just have one question for you. Are you sorry for what you did? First of all, they'd probably look at you like you're crazy, but I guarantee you that every one of them would say, of course I'm sorry. I don't want to be in here. See, they're not all the people that you ask, though, are going to be repentant. There will be those that will be regretful that they did that thing, but, and there will be those that certainly are repentant. And by the way, there are ministries in prison, prison ministries in which we should pray for. Because, I mean, it is, it is remarkable, some of the prison ministries and how they lead people to the Lord and the Word of God transforms their life. But anyways, sorry, that was a side note. That's not in my notes. But there is a difference between regret and repentance. For example, there is worldly sorrow in which we saw in Judas. You remember after Judas had uh, betrayed Jesus, it says that he was remorseful and he brought back the 30 pieces of silver. Ultimately, worldly sorrow ended up producing death in his life. But you remember there was godly sorrow in another man's life by the name of Peter. After Peter had denied Jesus, he went out and he wept bitterly. That's what Luke tells us. Luke tells us he went out and he ugly cried. It was just an ugly cry. It wasn't pretty. But it says after that, that Peter would go on and he would repent. And Jesus would restore him in John chapter 21. Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, not moan. I like what one pastor said. Don't moan, mourn. And there is within us, you know, that moment when we do something and the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin, there should not be a worldly sorrow that does not produce life. There should be a godly sorrow that brings about repentance and brings forth life in our life. Can I ask you, when you recognize that there is sin in your life, what is your outlook? Is it that of worldly sorrow or is that of godly sorrow that leads to repentance and leads to life? Now, as we continue on in verse 12, it says, therefore, although I wrote to you, he says, I do not do it for the sake of him who had done wrong, nor for the sake of him who suffered wrong, but for the care for you in the sight of God might appear to you. Paul's purpose in writing that sorrowful letter as or the severe letter, was not to take the sides in the dispute among the Corinthian Christians. His purpose was to demonstrate the concern in the sight of God for the church. And he wants to reiterate that. Now, as we continue on, we also find in verse 14, he says, for if in anything I have boasted to him, or boasted to him about you, he says, I'm not ashamed. But as we spoke all things, to you in truth, he says, even so our boasting to Titus was found true. Now, if you were with us in reading through 1 Corinthians and you read through all the issues that were taking place in the church, it would just be like, whoa, this is a lot. Could you imagine going to visit a church that had all the issues that were in First Corinth that Paul wrote about in 1 Corinthians? Years ago, I went and visited a church when I was on vacation 
And it was a small church. It was a, it was a smaller church, and we went to their Wednesday night Bible study, and which was even smaller. And uh, it was in a theater, and there was like six of us in there. And I was on vacation, and I went in, and my wife and my sister were with me, and uh, they had wa- gone into the washroom, and I was just kind of standing around, just just visiting the church, hanging out with my Bible, holding my Bible, and somebody walked up to me grabbed me by the neck. This is a true story, by the way. Grabbed me by the neck and kind of was jokingly saying, are you going to come back? And I was like, I don't think so. I, <laughs> I, um, nope, probably not now. I, uh, <laughs> and my wife and my sister came out of the washroom right when the guy's hands were around my neck. And my eyes must have been as big as saucers, man. Like, it was just, it was wild. It was like, you know, could you imagine going to visit a church and thinking, like, I am not coming back here after reading about all the issues that were taking place in 1 Corinthians? But look how Paul saw them. He saw them and he said, I have boasted about you to Titus. Isn't it interesting that Paul saw the potential of people in Christ? Just like Jesus saw the potential in various people. You remember when he came and he found Peter? You know, Peter was a fisherman, and he found Peter, and he says, listen, we're going to call you Peter from Simon to Peter, which means rock, even though Peter was more sandy, if anything, you know? It just, he was more shifty and just kind of shifting in different things. You think about when he found Levi, who was a tax collector. They would steal oftentimes from the people, and he brought Levi in, and he calls him Matthew, which means a gift. See, this is oftentimes what Jesus and how Paul would look at people. He would just say, hey, he saw the best in individuals. There's an old story of two young boys who were out at the playground at recess, and they were talking with one another. And if, you're not under, if you don't understand how oftentimes young boys think, this is a great way in this story. One boy looked at the other boy and said, aren't you glad you don't have to wear glasses? And the other boy said, yeah. They would just get in the way. Well, you know, like when we wrestle and we play basketball. He says, although, he says, I wouldn't mind wearing my grandma's glasses. And he said, what are you talking, the other boy said, what are you talking about? Why, what's, what's so special about your grandma's glasses? And he says, see, my grandma's glasses, they help her see differently. He said, well, what do you mean? He says, my grandma can see when people are hurting. He says, my grandma can see when people are tired. My grandma can see when people are discouraged, when people need to be fed, and she knows just what to say and just what to do when she sees them like that. And the other boy says, yeah, those are weird glasses. (laughs) But may God give us those eyes to see other people and not to see all the problems that they have in their life, but to see the needs and help us, and may the Lord help us step up and minister to those needs. Amen? And last off, we finish in verse 15 here. And he says, his affections, speaking of Titus, are greater for you as he remembers the obedience of you all and how with fear and trembling you received him. Although Titus was the carrier of that severe letter, Paul would write this verse to assure the Corinthian Christians that Titus loved the church very much. And in fact, even more now than ever. And probably Titus had seen much of the ugliness in the church among the Corinthian Christians. And although he could have had a chip on his shoulder, so to speak, Paul says, listen, I want you to know that he reported your repentance and he loves you more than ever now. You know, One day, I am certain that we will stand in heaven as believers saved by the grace of God through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And one day, we will stand in heaven, and I bet you we will meet people from the Corinthian church. There may be people that will come up to you and say, Hey, where are you from? You know, where where did you, where, you know, where, that's a weird concept, eh? Like, what time period are you from, you know? yeah, that's, anyways, I never thought about that. Anyways, <laughs> that clearly is not in my notes. I'm dumbfounded. Um, you know, oftentimes I just think, you know, 
ask people, what, what church are you from, you know, and I guess, what era are you from? And I guarantee you, there'll be people that come to me and say, you know, hey, I was in Edmonton, and I served at this church, and I'll say, what church did you go to? And I'm certain at one point in eternity, I will meet somebody from the Corinthian church, and I bet you they're going to say, hey, have you, we're from the Corinthian church, and I'll say, I've heard of you. And they'll say, oh, yeah? What did you hear about us? Um, heard you were getting drunk at the communion table. Um, heard another guy was living in immorality with a stepmom, and the rest of you were pridefully tolerant of it. Um, heard there was division over leaders. Uh, heard the wisdom of the world overtook the word of God in the church. Um, heard you were a little bit on the charismatic side and it kind of got a little crazy in there um, among the five or six other issues that were in there. And, you know, that's oftentimes how we think, isn't it? But how did Titus, he says, he remembered your repentance. You know, one of the easiest things for believers to do when they see somebody that has had sin in their life and they confess sin, is oftentimes they hold that against them until eternity. Listen, Titus, Paul says of Titus, he remembers your repentance. Paul could have said, hey, he remembered that situation, that situation. Like, those are all the things I think of. But he says he remembers your repentance. May the Lord give us that, that same vision that, that keeps no record of wrong. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy, for your grace. Lord, would you help us to see other people like that? To not constantly look up and see the wrong or the faults in other people, Lord, but to see the needs and help us to minister to them. And Lord, when there's repentance, Help us, Lord, not to hold grudges against other people. Thank you, Lord, that you never held a grudge against us, but you died for us at, your dark, at our darkest, Lord. You knew the worst about us, Lord, and you gave your life for us. We thank you for that, Lord. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen, amen.